and welcome to the Life Magnetics podcast or to my YouTube channel, depending on where you are consuming this content. My name is Crystal Ann Compton, and I am really excited to be with you today because I am introducing you to Tina Irwin. Now, Tina Irwin is a psychic and a ghost helper. And in specific, it is her life mission to help souls cross from this world into what she calls the heaven world. And according to Tina, many, many, many souls actually don't make that transition for a variety of reasons, which we actually get into. But that's not all we talk about in this conversation. Um, I think 30 years ago or so, Tina was actually attacked with black magic. And she talks about this experience, how it happened and what she did to combat that black magic. And also what happened to the person who sent her that black magic. We also get into what Tina calls dark astral magicians. These are lower level beings that exist in the fourth dimension predominantly and who influence souls or humans who are alive in 3D reality. Like this whole conversation was mind bending and so interesting. So if you are fascinated by life after death in the dead and the dying, what happens to them, the process of transition, or if you're interested to learn about these other realms, these lower realms and higher realms, then I know you are going to love this episode. So without further ado, let's get into today's conscious conversation with Tina Irwin. Tina Irwin is a psychic and ghost helper whose mission is to teach the living how to help the dead cross over into what she calls the heaven world. A student of spirituality all of her life, Tina runs the website ghosthelpers.com and is also the author of eight books on metaphysics. Welcome to the podcast, Tina Irwin. I'm so happy to have you. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. Oh, I'm excited to get into all of the things. But before we do, I love to ask our guests just about their background and truly what led them, the journey of their life that led them into the work that they currently do. So tell us a little bit about yourself. I started out as a little kid. An awful lot of children have psychic ability and I do help parents with psychic children. And I discovered it by accident when my Siamese cat, who was my best friend, died. And she, I was seven and I could see her ghost and she kept coming to me and she missed me and I missed her. Uh, the bond we have with animals is an extremely powerful bond. And that was really the first time I had awareness of it manifesting. And then, you know, in childhood, it manifested here and there, but it wasn't a big deal until I got into college and I started traveling and I I was in a very dangerous situation. I was living in Medellin, Colombia as an exchange student and we were on the side of a mountain and it was the a, a drunk was driving the Jeep I was in and it was a straight shot from off the side of the mountain into oblivion and death. And I'm I'm so terrified I can hardly function and I hear this voice say you have to stop this car. You're not supposed to die tonight. Stop the car. We're with you, but you cannot die tonight. You have too much to do this life. It's like, and so I, I fucked up my courage. It's a very male dominated society. And this was in 1970, this took place. And I said, stop the car, stop the car. And so they did. And there were, there were seven people in this vehicle. We all get out of the car and they have a flat tire. And they all said that I saved them because they didn't realize the tire was flat. And they put the really handsome guy I was dating as the driver of this car who was not drunk. And I, I realized at that moment that must be, I'm here for something, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, a, you know, I'm in my twenties. What do I know? But it exploded when I met and married my husband. And that was in 1973. So is that not the handsome guy that was driving the vehicle? No, no, no. <laughs> a different I left handsome him in guy. Columbia. Uh, <laughs> he was the sweet, this Colombian people are some of the sweetest people you will ever want to meet. Anyway, so. I have to, I have to ask you a question. Um, so when you hear this voice, 
So many people hear a voice and they think, oh, that's just me talking to me. That's just my little monkey mind. Was there a different quality to the voice that made you pay attention to it? And if so, what was the quality of it? Authority mm. in one word. There was an authority to the voice and that was not, it was a suggestion. It was a command. Tell them to stop the car. You cannot die tonight. It was, there was no mistaking it. And, and this is a very good question you asked. I'm so glad you asked it because a lot of times when you are evolving and beginning to awaken to psychic ability, you can't discern is it me or you know how do I know that that's real but there was so much authority in this voice they really stepped in and the higher realms can do that based on whoever their mortal field agent is and and that's that's all I am I'm somebody's field agent with a job to do and but you don't wake up to that job immediately. You have to evolve. There's a lot of a lot of karma attached, but it's learning to trust. And when I trust the voice, I mean, I gotta be honest, they've been right a hundred percent of the time. They mm -hmm. will if you trust if they're what they're telling you is for your highest and best good, and they have a track record and you become in resonance with this higher authority, then you build a partnership. That's the best way I can describe it. I was a, a lieutenant in the Navy living in Charleston, South Carolina, and I'm driving to work one night. I had to go back in, and I get on 26 East, and I get in the fast lane because I always do that. <laughs> and this voice said, move right three lanes, move right two lanes right now. So I looked at my mirrors and immediately moved right two lanes. And in the fast lane were railroad ties all the way up and down. I would have destroyed my car. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was seconds. So I didn't hesitate. I followed safety rules, but I believed them. And so it was building that rapport between them because I it was dusk. I couldn't see them. There was a car ahead of me and... And I, I realized other cars were going to start hitting them and it's before cell phones. So I, I was stunned. It was one of those searing moments. You don't forget. Would you say that this, these, this authority is angelic or would you say that this is something else? In my research and I am not a, I'm a naval, I'm a retired naval officer. So mm -hmm. I'm very left brained. I have this weird combination of right left brain. I wanted to understand the physics that went behind this. Who is this? Who am I talking to? And why did, it's like you look in the mirror and you go, gee, why did they pick me? Okay. So, and what I learned was there are angels and there are higher realm beings and they work as teams. Not everything is an angel. It's not a spirit. Spirit can be a hundred different things. There are higher realm beings and there are angels and sometimes they're angels and, but most of the cases it's a higher realm being. And if you're here for something you have, I, I guess I would say a manager and that person, that being looks out and helps guide your path. You still have free will, but if you listen, your path takes you on a very different track because you're listening carefully. Mm-hmm. So just out of curiosity, so it sounds like this authority is a role as opposed to a kind of being, and it can be um, occupied by a variety of beings, could be angels, could be ancestors, could be masters, maybe. Um, but what, what other kind of beings might be in this position? Because I, I'm just, I can hear my audience thinking, okay, well, sometimes I hear a voice. I mean, but can I trust that voice? Is it an angel? Or you're saying there's higher realm beings. What other kind of class of beings would, could they possibly be? If someone is urging you to do something that is detrimental, then there are lower realm intelligences. Mm -hmm. They are dark magicians from the, the lower astral realm. We live in the third dimension. The lower astral is the fourth dimension. Yes. The higher realms are the fifth dimension. So when you have that differentiation, but when you are hearing something that's for your greater good, 
and gently nudging you or warning you or screaming at you, which they've done to me sometimes, I'm a little dense. And um, I would say that they are, and I, I don't know if they're masters. I never, I don't particularly use that term as it applies to someone working with me. There are beings and they have a, there's a, if you think there's politics in mortal life, there's politics on the higher realms as well. Really? Make, make no mistake about it. And every being in the higher realms is also in a process of evolution. And if they work with a mortal person, they evolve as you evolve and you build a partnership. So I, and as you evolve to higher levels, you get new beings who manage you. And so if you are a, a person and someone says, you know, you might not want to be doing those cards or don't go to that seance or like in the movies, don't open the door. And you start to listen, then you build that rapport with whoever that and it can be an angel. Yes, you have the higher you raise your frequency, the higher ranking angel or spiritual being gets to work with you and it's a it's a, it's ultimately kind of a math problem it's all about your frequency you know if you're involved in blessing and prayer if you're involved in good works if you're trying to be of service to others you're raising your frequency and the more you're doing that then you qualify for a higher ranking being and then you graduate to other levels and I you help you help them graduate as well like you yes, guys are you both do. partnering so is it more of like a lateral relationship like we're yes, are we lateral. okay are we equal no we're not because there in a mortal body there is a density to us which is necessary you have to be in this dimension it's a dimension of time and space and gravity without gravity time and space cannot exist in the void that is deep space, there is no time, doesn't exist. We talk about light years. Well, that's that's current technology, but in the deep void, there, there's no time. In the fourth dimension, which is how you send prayer or angry thought or anything else, there's also no time mm -hmm. and there's no gravity. And so when you are focusing on what am I supposed to do, or you're looking for answers and you pray, you have to listen to the still small voice that says, go this way or this way. And they're not going to tell you what to do. That's why, you know, fortune telling and pendulums, you have to be careful of those things because that information is coming from a source and you don't know who the source is. So you have to learn to listen to your own inner self. And that requires a lot of personal strength and you can develop it. You can evolve to it. So interesting. So if someone knows that they're here, they have a life purpose to do good work, to serve at a higher level, to be a light, to shine that light, but have not yet engaged their team, their manager, is there a way to initiate that process? Can they like, can they call out to them? Can, how can they meet them? How can they begin to work with them? I have a, a book out that hopefully any day will be a um, audio book. It's in the ACX mill there. It's called Soul Evolution. And I explain the difference between a soul purpose and a soul mission. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a person's soul mission, soul purpose is to survive childhood or survive their abuser. But a soul mission where you think you're starting out and you don't know what you're going to do and it evolves into a mission. And I'll give you a very public example, which would be Princess Diana. Mm -hmm. Very public person, no education, no focus in life, marries this guy, isn't loved by her family, her any family she has, no one loves her. But the public adores her because she opens her heart of, to compassion. And as she seeks the service to others, her soul mission begins to evolve because she put herself in a position of demonstrating the compassion she wanted for herself, mm -hmm. which is one of the sweetest, yeah. most transparent examples you could ever have. 
And then she went on to work with AIDS patients and then a landmine issue, which Queen Noor took over after Diana died. So she started out with just the purpose of making it through, you know, the purpose of making it through life. But she evolved to her mission. And I don't know that I didn't sit down and say, gee, I wonder what my mission is. When am I going to start it? You know, I figured, you know, I'm a naval officer. I'm going to be married. You know, hopefully I'll have kids. And beyond that, I, when I retired from the Navy, I thought I was going to have a computer company. I designed software. <laughs> but apparently that wasn't what I was supposed to do. So I, a lot of things took place in the, my, my focus changed and I realized what I was supposed to do, but you can go your whole life and not realize it till you are in, in the later years of your life. And then mm -hmm. you awaken to it just like now Diana died at 36, but other people don't really understand it for a while. But if you're doing good works and you're raising your frequency and you fill yourself with love, you will evolve to that level. I wouldn't go looking for it. It will come to you. And as you evolve and refine in your vibration, the guides come to you or the guidance will come to you and make itself known? Absolutely. It's one of these things that, is it the chicken or the egg? Because you have you have done something that that you love others. And I think I think this happens with in every profession. I mean, there's a lot of questions about the medical profession right now, but there are, I've met them, nurses and doctors who have this feeling about their patient, even though what they think they're seeing is selling them contrary, they have a different feeling. You cannot go through life without being psychic. You can't drive a car without psychic ability. Yes. It is just without understanding, you can't be a functioning human being without that sense of what is right and wrong, your personal ethics. That is the beginning of really being psychic. Hmm. Hmm. I love that. I 100% I, I agree with that. I think we're all born with the infrastructure to be fully connected to the world of spirit. I mean, we go through stages of dormancy. We close down some of this functionality due to life experience or intention, but we can always turn it back on because it's part of us and it's always exactly. available to us. Um, you mentioned to take you back to your initial story that you married your husband i think in 1973 and then things just really started popping off for you like what happened what shifted and changed i um my husband and i were coming up to 50 years together oh congratulations how That's many awesome. psychics are married that long um uh i had known him in so many past lives and one of us always died but this was the life we got to have a whole life together but we had to work at it but what happened was i started I had an attempted possession right after we were first married. Oh, oh, I, oh okay. <laughs> Tell me. That was a, an interesting, that's in ghost stories from the ghost point of view, volume <laughs> three, what happened. And I had a premonition of his death and I was able to save his life. And all that was in the first year we were being married. We were married. It was it's like, whoa. And I could see and sense things more and more when we lived in Italy for three years. And that was then all of a sudden there's one premonition after the other. Then we moved to Charleston and we had a haunted house and it's been a real psychic life. And then we moved to Virginia and we lived in Witch Duck Point where they ducked witches. I mean, <laughs> uh, and then we moved to San Diego. So, and then it was just one ghost coming to me after the other. And, and I, and it was in San Diego that I realized how to cross over the dead. I learned how to do that. And I, I developed a skill set called remote viewing, which I didn't know I was going to get to learn, but apparently that was a skill set I needed. So that that's how it's something about my husband was my rock of Gibraltar. He still is my rock of Gibraltar and anchor. Hmm. So when you say you developed remote viewing, we know that the military was also working with this technology. Did you do this through the military or your time in the Navy, or is this something you developed no, outside of no, that? No, I wasn't. There were a lot of psychic naval officers. <laughs> I mean, I worked for the submarine force for 20 years. You deliberately submerge your vessel. You had to be pretty psychic and feel your ship, feel your crew, mm -hmm. 
feel your circumstances. So um, I developed remote viewing, not because I wanted to, but because someone tried to kill me using black magic. Oh, God. Okay. So, all right. Well, so then that happened. How does that prompt remote viewing? Like, how did you experience that? I learned how to return the energy that was being sent to me. And I was so green in 1992. I did not know how to do a fraction of the things that I can do today. And every experience either teaches you something and you grow from it or it shuts you down. And so I learned if this magician hadn't targeted me, I couldn't, I couldn't be having this conversation with you today. So I have a gratitude to this dark being for opening a world to me. When I learned how to return the energy, what happened was he died, to be blunt. I had no idea that was going to happen. But I have the right to be safe in my own body. And if you're sending me blessing and prayer, and I return it to you, you're just going to be a glow bug. But if you're sending me something really dark, I'm sorry, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And they were not used to someone ever sending it back. When he died, because I was connected to him, I could see him leave his body. That was like this incredible, I could see him leave his body. I could see his wife come in. I could see the paramedics. And I could see all of these things happening to him. I could see him in the, the ambulance as they rushed him and they pronounced him. I could see these horrible beings coming after him as he was pronounced dead. And uh, one of my brothers was with me and he looked at me and he said, we should cross him over. And I said, okay, but I didn't know how to do that. Everyone has a first day. So I asked angels to help me because I didn't know what I was doing. And as I'm asking these angels, this doorway opens up because we were doing something that was beneficial. We didn't judge this man. There was no prejudice against him. He took an action for whatever the reason, but he wasn't mine to judge. So as he's about to walk into this light, he turns back to me and he said, I tried so hard to kill you, to stop you. Why are you helping me? And I said, you know, you're not mine to judge. So glad that's not my job. It's beyond my pay grade, thank goodness. And he says, and he shook his head and he crossed over. And from that point on, it was an init it's like it was an initiation into spiritual growth. So I developed that. I retired in 92 from the Navy. After that, um, this actually took place in 93. After that, all these things just started happening. And learning to remote view was excruciatingly painful. I could remote view, but I would be wiped out for two days. It was exhausting. And I didn't know, I there's no there was no school that I could go to. I would have to trust what I could, could learn and build that skill set. Because it's not a gift. If you can do this, you see horrific things. It's not, it's not something you can give back. But I realized if I could develop it, then there was a huge number of, a greater number of people I could help. And that's, that's why I worked on it. Well, I, I have to ask some context to this experience. Um, so this gentleman was sending you black magic. How did you, who was he to you generally? How did you know that this was happening? How did you sense it? And then how did you send it back? Can you share that with us? Yes, because he I had a computer company. I was a value-added reseller for Apple Computer. There were two in the country. I was one of them. I developed this astounding software program. And I did 20 trade shows for Apple Computer in one year. And at one of the trade shows, this it was a, one of the last I did. It was in San Diego. And it was at the convention center. And this guy walks up and he said, I want to be a programmer for you. And I said, I'm barely making a living as it is. I can't afford a programmer. He said, well, here's my card. <laughs> and that was on 28 February. 
from that moment forward could happen with a business card. He built a connection. He had a, because I put it in my, what we used to use instead of cell phones, day timers. So I put it in my day timer and it was always with me. Mm -hmm. And then he called my house twice and left a message on my answering machine, which had a magnetic tape. Mm -hmm. And what happened was I went downhill in the space of about 30 days, like a rock. I reached the point I couldn't sleep at night. I had horrific nightmares. I couldn't stop coughing. You either sneeze uncontrollably. These are all basic black magic tricks. You sneeze uncontrollably. You can't sleep. You, um, you feel like someone's watching you. You can't explain it. You start seeing things that you know are not or you think are not real. And you can't, I reached the point, I couldn't drive a car, I couldn't get up, I couldn't sleep at night. And I, at one point, my husband um, said, what are we going to do? And I, I, my brother helped me all he could. And one day he came down to see me. Um, and he said, we've got to figure out what's happening to you. And and he went through and he found this business card. He said, who is this guy? And I started wanting to vomit because I pulled it out. And he said, quick, go get some silk. Go get me a silk scarf. And I said, well, I, you know, I love my silk scarf. She said, good God, just get me a scarf. Okay. I get the scarf and he wraps it up in opposite directions. One is vertical, one is horizontal. Silk apparently is one of the highest frequency fabrics that along with alpaca and vicuña and angora. But for magic, you need silk. Uh, and then I learned so much and much less expensive things you can use. And it's like someone turned a switch and I woke up. Hmm. And then we disposed of the card. And it's like, oh my gosh, it happened a second time. And I, he said, did he contact you any other ways? And I said, the magnetic tape. So we wrapped that up and threw that away. I'm thinking, I had to get some cheap silk here. This is crazy. Well, what happened was when all that energy is returned in the silk, he can't escape it. It's like someone's constantly facing you with who and what you have are and what you have done. It's staggering and so as that was taking place everything he said to me and now that I can remote view I could see inside his body and I could see what he was doing to me was shutting my lungs down that's what he was trying to do the endless coughing you cough till you vomit you can't stop coughing it's a classic sign that or sneezing and um uh, I thought I was home free. The coughing stopped. Everything stopped until they started his autopsy. And I knew the date and time the autopsy started because it's like she opened his chest to her horror. It was a female coroner because I could see her. And it's like, oh, my gosh, I can see her. And all this horrible stuff is coming back to me. And because I had what's called an ACA cord to him. An Akka cord is, comes from your solar plexus, this thin blue strand of Kino Akka substance, which is described in the Huna tradition. It looks like you're very familiar with that. Mm -hmm. From Hawaii, yep. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, when you study the Huna tradition, it's the closest to the teachings of Christ you could possibly find, then followed by the Tibetans. And so as that was happening, I am disintegrating. I mean, it was horrible. And and I talked to my brother and he said, this is your long, dark night of the soul. You have to decide what you're here for. I can no longer help you. And he left. And I, I've never prayed as hard as in my life as I have ever prayed. And I, and I woke up in the morning and my husband went, he was about to go to work and he looked at me and he said, are you going to be all right? And I said, no, nope, I will be dead by noon. I can feel it coming. I can see it. So you're going to, I'm going to have to go to an emergency room. So we get there and the guy says, oh my God, you got about two hours and your lungs are going to be completely shut down. And he said, you're going to be an asthmatic the rest of your life. And I said, no, I'm not. I know what caused this. Don't label me. How dare you? <laughs> um, 
anyway, this will never happen again. So I got my lungs back and he said, but you have to see it. You're this doctor. Or you have to see this doctor. Well, the first doctor was a woman from India and she said, and I explained to her what happened. And she said, you're good. You understand it has happened to me. Don't worry about it. It's just a little black magic. I'm thinking she's pretty cool. <laughs> then they send me to a guy who's a pulmonologist. And he said, what happened? And I said, you'll never believe me. And he said, you're a naval officer. I'll believe you. Because my wife and I, who's also a physician, are seeing this over and over and over again. There's no explanation. All of a sudden, a person with no history of asthma presents with asthmatic symptoms and this horrible stuff in their lungs. And we can't put an, we can't wrap our brains around it. What happened to you? And so I explained it. I said, it's black magic. It's a physics issue. Someone's sending energy. They can send it you know, without encumbrance through the ether. And it hit me, but I now know how I'm learning how to protect myself even better. So it's not going to happen again. So he said, so you're not an asthmatic. You're going to be fine. And I was. And then I started helping other people who had these same symptoms. And my first question is, what did he give you? And I am a student of mythology. You remember the story of Persephone? Mm -hmm. Well, what was the first thing Mother of Nature asked of her daughter when she came back from Hades? What did he give you? Mm. She said, six pomegranate seeds. Well, there's nothing wrong with pomegranates. But the concept still applies. What did? What is the connection that this magician has to you? Mm -hmm. And when you start looking at how these things work, you begin to see the physics of it. Wow. <clears throat> that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, about a year ago, I, I, I had a, I had a friend once very, very good friend, a very magical shamanic woman. And we were very close, but we had a falling out and it was a really weird, chaotic falling. out. I was not, I didn't know why it happened. Um, but then she really turned on me. Um, not, never to me, to all like of my, my people in our circle and such. And she was going kind of on a campaign against me. I think she, she still might be, I'm not sure, but um, it never really affected me, but there was always like a nagging feeling about it. Like I kind of got a sense when she was thinking about me, I'm intuitive anyway, and I can sense aqua chords in myself and others, but it, I, I came to realize, Oh, wait a minute. She gave me something. She gave me this beautiful, like, um, crystal and it used to be right there in front of the buddha that you're looking at um and she also gave me some oil for, for candles and she gave me uh, something else and i had kept them because they were beautiful and i liked them and they were useful and i loved her no matter what like I, I didn't understand why we had a falling out but spirit kept on tapping on my shoulder and saying you need to get rid of these items because whether she's conscious to it or not these are actual conduits for her attention and focus on you and serve as a kind of oculus or a seeing instrument into your space and here it is in my meditation space my spiritual space right in my buddha and it serves as kind of a mirror into what i am doing and i could feel it and i just never really and for somebody spiritual doing this stuff for decades i can't believe I didn't realize it. So we took the crystal, we took the items, we returned the crystal to the water, we disposed of the other items. And I did like ceremony and things to cut the cords. But I believe what you're saying ultimately is what I'm saying is that you have to look at what they've given you. You have to look at what they've deposited in your environment. Is it still there? Can you remove it? Now with this gentleman, why in the world would he, did he do this intentionally to you? Or is this, was he just It was toxic? intentional. He was, it was intentional. He was part of a coven oh okay all right in other words you have to remember time i may mean, do a dissertation on how time works but time there are other beings who can see what this particular individual is going to do in the future so they if they stop them at this point in time all the things you're going to accomplish here never happen but if they fail then you grow exponentially from the experience if you choose to, mm -hmm. and then you can work on your mission far more. Hmm. So very interesting. You mentioned a little while back, uh, dark astral 
magicians, not musicians, but magicians. What are these? What are you talking about? And I would imagine these are fourth dimensional beings. Or yes, they're fourth dimensional beings. They're lower astral beings, and um, the the easiest way to begin to wrap your brain around this is that where do serial killers come from when a person is a serial killer they come in this way they don't have guardian angels they have somebody else who's a controller they're puppets on a string it's like the coldplay song puppets on a lonely string but they're puppets on a string and these can be anything from a world leader to you know the, the crazy guy next door and this it's kind of a long explanation i don't know if you're okay with explaining I, exactly i am if you are what happens is when a child comes in and and they start no no one is innocent we all come in with karma we're not created equal we're created in karma so a person comes in and there is sexual abuse the root chakra is such a sacred place and when you violate that you take the energy of the soul and basically sexual abuse is an initiation into the dark side to be blunt so when that happens pieces of the soul are shaved off life after life after life until there is a point at which the soul doesn't recognize themselves they have no idea who they really used to be. They die, they go into the lower astral, they don't cross over. And then the they become the tool of a very, very dark being. And then they do that being's bidding. And we know that this is true. And I don't expect somebody to just believe me. They should say, how do you know that's true? Good question. Because every faith on the planet has a 23rd Psalm. Lo, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I'm sorry, when you die, why would you fear evil? Because in the fourth dimension, there are some dark things. For thou art with me. They're telling you, remember that God is with you. And at the, at the, as it proceeds, it says, he restoreth my soul. Mm. So if you don't cross into the heaven world, your soul is not restored. So lifetime after lifetime of shredded ethics and, you know, economic violence or whatever it is you're doing or physical violence or spiritual or mental violence erodes all the elements of what made us spiritually positive beings until we become spiritually negative beings we sell our souls without realizing it or we are sold into this which is what happens with sexual abuse if you take a person who has suffered with terrible sexual abuse and you cross that soul over or you cross over murderers and i have a book called the crossing over prayer book there is a prayer to cross over murderers so that they can be restored and they won't keep reincarnating from the lower astral and become someone's puppet. It doesn't erase the karma they created with the actions they took. It enables them to have better guidance and how they reincarnate is based on how the higher realms manage that. That's what causes black magic, it's what causes serial killer. And all this focus on Satanism right now, you're feeding something really large. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Well, actually, um, who are the beings that are the puppet masters? Are these demons? Are they archons? Who are these beings? I would, I... They're lower astral beings. They don't like to, they don't want to reincarnate because it takes very little energy to, you remember in Star Wars, this dark being that controlled Darth Vader? This is a classic example of a person 
who forgot their humanity. And his master, who controlled Darth Vader, and then all of the, the puppets down the line, is this horrific being who's actually, those beings are actually extremely fragile in the astral. They don't need much energy. And they have a ton of minions who who work on, you know, the beings that they have they have collected and they make sure some of them are remarkably wealthy and the, and they allow them to misuse the wealth. There are people like um uh the wife of the guy who started McDonald's, can't think of her name, um, who take their wealth and they find ways to help the world with what they have. And then there are people who don't. And so just because you have great wealth doesn't mean you're evil, but you can be. Mm -hmm. And if you want that, it's going to cost you. It's why the issue of if it's the issue of tarot cards, tarot cards make a person feel powerful, but they don't know who is giving them the information and whoever's providing that information will take their pound of flesh whenever they want because you're not paying them. You think spirit's talking to you, but it's a black magician. And that black magician can come after your health, your wealth, your relationship, your business, your friends. I mean, and is this you know, always the case? I mean, can't you create a protected space and use something like an oracle card or a divination nope, tool? No, nope, nope. You say no. Okay. Absolutely not. Because think about it. Christ didn't use those cards. Buddha certainly didn't need those things. And no one in the Huna tradition would have ever used those things. They are diversionary tools to entice people in to do things that give them a false sense of power. Your power, your truest power comes from your connection to God without an intermediary. You do not need those cards. You don't need a Ouija board. You don't need any of those things. You need your own personal private connection to God. And if it's if your tradition is Tibetan or Huna or Christian or Jewish, be the very best that faith has to offer. And at the end of the day, it's all goodness that each faith, the best of each faith is goodness. So when you started doing the work of crossing over these beings, especially lower astral former human beings, I imagine you would come up against these puppet masters and, you know, there would be some sort of a war of darkness and maybe some attacks from that realm too. But is it, is it because they're not strong necessarily, or they all are fragile that they are easy to kind of combat from your point of view? That would be arrogant of me okay. to say that. I would say it took me a lot of years to know how to work in that realm and build layers of knowledge, of knowledge of physics. True physics works in every realm. It's like salt works in every realm. Dragon's blood works in every realm. Sage is worthless. You have to understand the physics of what you're dealing with build your personal team before you can even consider taking on something that's this dangerous. Hmm. Have you, have you been attacked by these types of beings because of the work in the light that you do? Yes. Hmm. Okay. I was six feet tall and now I'm five foot one. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord. Um, wow. This is so fascinating. Um, and I could talk to you about this forever, Tina, truly, but I want to pivot a little bit to talk about, your ultimate mission in life, which is the crossing of these souls. And you, we, we were talking before we started recording uh, about just how many folks are dying right now and how much of a ministry opportunity it is for heart oriented, spiritually connected people to help those souls to cross. Can we talk about your mission in this way, why you do this work, why you think it's important? Yes, and thank you for this opportunity. Souls who die, a lot of times they don't know they're dead. Children don't know what to do when death comes. They have no idea. And an awful lot of children are just dropping dead right now. And teenagers 
it's it is truly heartbreaking. We have over six thousand dead in Turkey right this minute. One minute they're asleep in their bed and the next minute the day never comes. They don't know they're dead. And so people who do know they're dead don't know what they're supposed to do next. They're clueless because very few traditions tell people what happens. And you shouldn't have to hire a psychic to help your dead loved one or strangers or your haunted house. And it took me a lot of years to develop what I call the crossing over prayer. And I like I it came about in a few short minutes here it came about because I was at a my phone broke I was at a shopping mall shopping in a handbag store that's you know thousands of dollars worth of handbags I'm never going to buy and I showed someone a card from my from one of my ghost story books and she said oh my god this handbag store is haunted so I cleared the store and I we kept in touch and she said well we've got all these homeless who came back and I and I said, you know what? I need to develop a prayer that I want you to beta test. She said, oh my gosh, we would be glad to because nobody wants to open the store. It's so terrifying. And so I created the crossing over prayer. And what it's designed to do is to give ever, anyone the power to help the living, to help the dead, which also helps the living. And so they would say this prayer every morning before they opened the shop. And pretty soon they didn't have any more dead coming. And then they kept it. Then I asked a bunch of, I was doing a lot of radio um, in 2012 when I developed this and I had radio hosts use it. And I had a, a radio show I did in Belgium and the, that host took it through battlegrounds and graveyards throughout you know, where he was in Belgium. And he would hear these little thank yous and thank yous. A lot of those people are still fighting. They don't know the war ended, whether it's, you know, Austro-Hungarian War or World Wars One or Two or whatever the war was, or just people who died. And I have had um, people cross over murderers using the crossing over prayer very successfully with validation. The, the story about that one is pretty bone chilling. So the prayer works, and in the prayer there is there are several statements that say right now, and the reason that is is because in the fourth dimension, there is no time. And what you're saying is this is to be done right now in this moment. And you are, are asking the help of angels. You are asking God to help you. And every human being on earth has the right to do that. No one can abrogate that right. And I created something called the Crossing Over Prayer Book. There are 88 prayers that help the living and the dead. If your neighbor committed suicide, you know, what do you say to their spouse? There's prayers for that. The, cross, the compassion prayer for suicide. The compassion, there's another prayer for crossing over a murdered loved one. Or a child dies and you say, I'll pray for you. What are you saying? What prayer are you sending? What can you send? That's what this book is designed to do. It's being used all over the world now. And so... Again, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share this piece of information so that if if your aunt or uncle just, you know, died for whatever the reason is, you can help them. And what happens is when the prayer is said, this light comes to this soul and embraces them and covers them with this beautiful golden cloak that starts to heal whatever it was that caused their death. Because a lot of people are, if they know they're dead, some of them are guilty. I should have done this, or I was born in sin and I died in sin. I mean, they're never going to cross over if they believe that. But God's love is available to every human being on this planet. I don't care what faith you were born in or what you believe. Whether you're an atheist or not, the physics are the same. There's no physics for atheists and the rest of us. It's all the same. So contemporary lore would say that when we die we see a light and or we are attended by angels and or ancestors who come and get us and make that transition they're helpful they're facilitators in that way so would it do you think that's true or do you think that everybody true. needs a prayer okay it is true in a lot of situations that's absolutely true i my father said he started to be able to see his grandmothers and mm -hmm. and and i knew that they were coming for him and he died in a peaceful setting in a hospital. But if you're in an earthquake and a building collapses on you, you don't wake up and you don't know you're dead. 
if you are in a car accident and you're denying death because you can't see your body, you're going to stand at the accident site. Well, but doesn't somebody time. come and get them or isn't there a light for them? Doesn't somebody come and say, hey, you're dead? You see the light, but you can't believe it's for you. Okay. Look at Patrick Swayze. Mm -hmm. Remember the movie Ghost? Yes. Okay. That's one of the most accurate films. He saw the light. He didn't just go in it. There was no angel who came for him. The lower realm intelligences came for the murderers, eventually those two men. Um, but I could have crossed them over too. Hmm. Even in the lower astral, they're they're findable. And so the, the point is, each person's death is as unique as the person. It's not a one size fits all any more than each of us are the same as another. And a child may see the light and still have no idea that they're supposed to go to it. I mean, I crossed over thousands and thousands and thousands of children. And a child that's human trafficked, it's going to be hard to see the light because there's so much darkness that surrounds them. Really? I, I guess I just hoped that there would be a being to just pick them up and take them on in, you know, but it doesn't always work that way. It depends on what their frame of mind and their, their frequency is as a child. And if they've been treated terribly, horribly, then it would be dip more difficult to reach them. Their frequency is lower. It's harder. Yeah. We all die with a certain numerical frequency, which we have no knowledge of or no awareness of, but it exists. Again, it's the physics of metaphysics. Once we can understand that, everything we do to raise frequency and build this higher realm connection is beyond important. I, I, uh, my grandson was being harassed and my daughter-in-law called me and she said, we think there's somebody with Jack. So I, I remote viewed their house and there's this, this little seven-year-old and she followed my granddaughter home from school and she was harassing baby Jack. And when I asked her what happened to her and she said, I don't know. And I said, well, what's the last thing you remember? And she said, all I know is mommy cries. I said, sweetie, what's the last thing you remember when you were happy? I was swinging. She said, I was swinging and swinging and I was swinging so high. And I said, and you let go, didn't you? And she said, yeah. And then I was standing next to mommy and mommy was crying and crying and mommy can't hear me. Hmm. And so I brought in a child angel for her. And I had them skip across and then Jack stopped crying. Hmm. So she had no idea. I mean, I've had I, I just lots and lots and lots and lots of children. Babies don't know what to do. Really? It's hard. Babies just don't go naturally into the arms of God. <laughs> you would think so. I would, you would hope so. You would hope so, but uh, not always. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, there are prayers to cross over children, uh, babies. It's, you know, it doesn't hurt to say a prayer. Of course. And that was the question that I, I had. So somebody might say, well, you know, my father died. We prayed for him. I assume he's in heaven. But just in case, maybe I should say a prayer. I mean, Neither it would never. Mm -hmm. I have a, I have a child. Uh, I have a a client in Texas with a super psychic nine-year-old and um, they, the family has some relatives who are drug addicts. Well, with fentanyl right now, mm. that could be mm -hmm. an awful lot of families. So this psychic child is seeing dead drug addicts night after night and she's terrified every night. Okay. They may see the light, but they're not going to it. And so she's, I, there are several tools I gave this child, but one of them was the prayer. And all of a sudden, this child, she's still seeing the dead, but she now knows how to cross them over. Mm -hmm. And she's not afraid anymore. She can sleep in her own bed. What a concept. This is reminding me, this whole, com I have a wall of books here. It's um, reminding me of a book, I think, written by Bruce Moen called The Afterlife Review. He was a student, I think, of Bob Monroe, like he was over at the Monroe Institute doing astral yeah, projection. Yeah. yeah. And I think he, he, he wrote a book called 
afterlife knowledge there it is afterlife knowledge guide that's what it's called and um he talks about forming a group of people who very specifically do this work and they do it as a group they go into the astral they find folks who are wandering around or souls that are aimless and they help to cross them over i don't know if you've ever heard of that book but it's kind of talks I haven't about heard of that book there's a brazilian book that goes into agonizing detail on this um and this brazilian doctor came up with a system which is mm -hmm. it's not for the faint of heart but if you can use their system you can be very effective um what's the name of the book um spirit and matter spirit and matter I'm writing it down okay by jose um, lacerda acevedo uh would you say that people should follow that protocol or is there or do you do it in no, a different way i would way not recommend that for the faint it's not for the faint of heart if okay. you're new at this don't don't that's not your book if you're really really advanced that's still a tough book okay it's still a really tough book but if you can master that you can move on volumes of people and when you're dealing with an earthquake situation mm. you know you can you can you can use that tool but you can use this prayer as well because you remember there's there's no resistance in the astral there's no there's no gravity there's no space right there's no matter so prayer moves anywhere in the world you want it that's how astral projection works or remote viewing works it's so much safer for the psychic to remove you than astral project well, you're astral projecting to another location. Right. I cleared a house in San Diego last month, and I have a lot of clients who are real estate agents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, but that was it. Open Sorry. doorways with the things that they do. So, right. Well, that was an interesting thing that you said, and I noted it that when you remote view, you are physically like you have to recover. It may take you a few days, and I'm wondering to myself, self, why? And I'm I'm wondering if it's kind of like the wormhole effect of like having to put your essence into um a channel go to another location perceive what's happening and then come back through the channel into the body i'm wondering if that is causing like a physical effect or why do you think you you struggle for a couple of days after doing remote viewing oh that's when i first started i don't struggle anymore okay um why did you, uh, do you do some sort of a protection or practice that helps you? I do a lot of different practices that, okay. that help me and years and years and years and years and years and years of doing it. Okay. And after you've done it for this long, you, you really develop a huge skill set because what has to happen is your third eye has to go from the size of the diameter of a pea to the size of a, you know, a platter, not a dinner plate, a platter. Well, and even in when you are really skilled at it and you've gotten your third eye large enough to be able to manage that job, you still, you have to keep your health in pristine condition. Can't allow any contaminants. I can't smoke or drink. I don't eat pork. Um, I'm very, very, very careful organic you know the same all the things you do to keep your frequency high but remember brain work which is what remote viewing is is the largest usage of insulin in the body not your pancreas it's your brain uses more insulin than any other organ in the body and so you might either be if you do a ton of it you're going to be tired you have to give yourself a lot of self-care to preserve who and what you are in addition to your, you must pay attention to your surroundings and keep them at a high frequency as well. So when you say you must pay attention to your surroundings, are you talking about your, the literal like contents in your home? Are you talking about relationships or what do you, or are you talking about in the spirit world? I'm talking about in your physical world. So, I am a feng shui practitioner. And so you have a house that's feng shui. I have thousands and thousands of crystals. So the energy of blessing and prayer going through your crystals and like the singing bowl on your shelf, I have huge singing bowls. 
Um, and when you're using those things, you're shifting the frequency of your location, which positively affects your neighbors, by the way. And it keeps your place. But those are practices that you have to maintain on a daily basis. They're really important. Hmm. Okay. That makes total sense. Um, you've given us so much information. I have to, I want to ask you one more thing, if it's okay. Is there a general prayer for crossing that you can share right now with us or the audience that we can start using right now? Yes. The prayer is also on ghosthelpers.com and the prayer is free on the on that website. And I can read it if you would like me to do Yes, that. I would love that. Thank you. Okay. This is the crossing over prayer. Dearest Lord above, I humbly request that you take any and all souls who have found my divine light of service into the heaven world right now. I ask that an angel wrap each soul in a blanket of healing light right now. I pray that every single soul will use the light bridge provided by my angelic team to transition into the heaven world right now. I send love and healing to all souls no matter how they died, no matter their level of guilt, without any judgment or prejudice whatsoever. May the light of your love, Father, embrace and keep all of these souls now and forever. Amen. Amen. That's beautiful. And again, that can be found at ghosthelpers.com. And once again, you are an author of eight books, and I'll put a link to for people to be able to check out all of those books on Amazon or on your website. Um, and do you do, I, I know you're a psychic as well. Do you work with people one-on-one? -on -one? You say you have clients. I do work with people one-on-one -on -one, parents with psychic children. I don't traditionally work with the child. I work only with the parent, mm -hmm. keeping the parent squarely in charge. I help people who have unusual spiritual problems or they feel like something isn't working. Like the couple who could never sleep at night. They could only sleep during the day. Night was, they had night terrors in their sixties. So it, Yes, what was I going on with that? What was going on with that? Were they did they were they under attack? They worked with somebody who had this program and they had all the books and everything. And um they were they were basically feeding a black magician. And when we got rid of again, what did they give you? Mm -hmm. We got rid of all of the material this man had given them, cleared the house, and then cleared, you know, I did some past life stuff with them. It took it took a couple months, but we were able to finally clear it all up and the <laughs> The woman was so grateful. She made me a quilt. Oh, wow. I never <laughs> really, it was, a, it was a small quilt, but it was so beautiful. I was really grateful. And she said, you know, I, I got my life back. I'm not, I, I can sleep at night. I feel like a normal person again. Hmm. So if somebody wanted to seek out your services for one-on-one -on -one consultations or work, could they do that on ghosthelpers.com or is there somewhere yes, else? Yes, it's, to... it's contact at ghosthelpers.com. Beautiful. Well, Tina, this has been so well, I want to say fun, but fascinating. <laughs> it has been, I mean, I love to learn. I love to hear people's perspectives on the world of spirit. Thank you so very much for your time, for uh, sharing all of your experiences. It was really wonderful and super wonderful to meet you as well. Thank you so much for having me and giving me this opportunity to share this prayer with all of your listeners. Thank you Abs so much. Absolutely. Ghosthelpers.com. <laughs>